Proverbs chapter 27. Last week we looked back at the year just previous, or we attempted to, I suppose, in just glancing back and being thankful for what the Lord has graciously given to us, and looking forward as well, because we talked about how that um, God created our bodies in such a way that our necks don't turn all the way around the way an owl's do. Instead, uh, they only look 180 degrees. And uh, so you can watch the children leave. That's <laughs> my mistake. But as we um, consider that subject again and look at a second part of it, there are a few points I wanted to make to continue on with it. And it was to, to emphasize things like paraphrasing. Do you know... There are some versions of the Bible which we refer to as paraphrases. Back when I became a Christian in the 70s, then a long time ago, there was a uh, version of the Bible which came out called the Living Bible. You're familiar with it. It was actually um, created by a man called Ken Taylor. And it wasn't originally his plan to do a translation of the Bible. What he was really and originally intending to do was to paraphrase the Bible in a way that his children would get something from it because he saw that they struggled with their understanding of the Scripture. So he began doing that. And then, of course, there were others who picked up on what he'd done and said, wow, this is really great. You need to keep this going. So he did the New Testament. And uh, then they said, you need to get this published. And so he created the Taylor Publishing Company, and he um, published the New Testament and called it the Living Letters. And it was never his intention to go through the entire scripture and paraphrase the whole thing, but because of its popularity, he did. And, of course, many were (laughs) blessed by his um, paraphrase of the scripture. There were also those who were very critical of it because they said this isn't what it says, especially, you know, words in the, in the, you know, the Old Testament. There's quite a few comical phrases, like uh, the time when Elijah is mocking the prophets of Baal. That's a good one, isn't it? You know, and he's mocking them. Of course, you get the spirit of it and you understand why he translated it in the way he did or paraphrased it. But he said, when he was mocking them, he said, you know, perhaps your God is out sitting on a toilet. This was uh, from the New te- from his, his using the words he's out pursuing. I don't think that's what it was in the original languages. But his children understood the fact that he was mocking. And there are others, which I wouldn't repeat, um, that he translated and paraphrased in those ways. But in a more modern context, men like Eugene Peterson have translated the message. In fact, the call to worship that I used from 2 Timothy yesterday, Joth uh, read that passage to us from the message. And you wouldn't even necessarily recognize it if you were to look at it word by word. But Eugene Peterson, in his way of paraphrasing, has done a tremendous job at making it real for us and making something that might be more difficult to understand in a classical language kind of way, he made it into a common language. There are preachers, again, who just don't like paraphrasing at all. It's just wrong. It's evil. And yet every one of those preachers who don't like it will paraphrase every Sunday morning when they get up behind the the pulpit. They read what the Bible says, and then they put it into a language that you can understand. In fact, some would even say that's what preaching is, is taking the Scripture and making it come alive for the people. And so there's nothing wrong with the idea of paraphrasing. If anything, we need for it to become really real to us, for us to be able to apply it. The New Testament is written in a, a language which in Aramaic um, you know, came out in a, in a common language of the people. In fact, there is that, that language called Classical Greek, and then there is the language called Koine Greek, which is what Jesus would have been you know, part of in speaking, which was the common language of the people. It was what the people would have easily understood and used. 
So I say all that to give you kind of a background to what I want to say this morning. It's a powerful tool, and if we look at some of the verses relating to the past year and the coming year and all the things that are going on, there are passages in Scripture which are very potent passages. If we put them into a paraphrased language, they can become even more powerful. So that's what I kind of want to do with four verses this morning and have that be our reflection. Proverbs chapter 27, I've had you turn there. Look at verse 1. Probably one of the most powerful verses in the scriptures it relates to the future. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Is that a mouthful? Do not boast about tomorrow. You do not know what a day may bring forth. Now, if I were to take that passage and paraphrase it in an easy-to-understand way for me, as if that's not easy enough, I would just simply say, tomorrow isn't promised. The um, Christian brethren out in the world will often package everything that they announce with the initials DV. You've heard it if you've been a Christian for any length of time. And that stands for Deo Valente, which is Latin for God willing. In Texas, we used to have the phrase, um, if the creek don't rise. That's it. You know, they would say, you know, I'll be over if the creek don't. And of course, it had its practical back backing to the days where if you could drive down the road and the creek hadn't covered the road, you'd get there. Otherwise, you'd have to turn around and go home. But when it comes to God willing, being able to boast about tomorrow, none of us has a promise about tomorrow in any way, shape, or form. That's a sobering thought because for some of us, we realize that our health is at such a stage in our lives that we never really know when we get up in the morning, if there's a little ache or a little pain, whether this will be the last one, you know. But then when you're younger, of course, we jump out of bed, similar to the way Nathan jumped towards the coffee this morning uh, when he went over, but just a kind of a vibrant, bouncy kind of feeling. Um, And yet, I've known many of those people who've died unexpectedly. Um, The tragic story I've often told, which goes back to um, a time when I was in Christian radio and used to listen to a program called Focus on the Family with Dr. James Dobson. Some of you may remember that program. I think he's subsequently started another. But James Dobson, part of a huge ministry called Focus on the Family, used to love to play basketball. So when they built their new complex of offices, he included a basketball court inside of his office building so he could take a break and go play basketball. And, of course, consequently, he would attract all kinds of major league basketball players to come and uh, and be his guest. They would arrange those interviews so that he'd have an opportunity to take them out on the court. And uh, one of them was a famous basketball player called Pistol Pete Maravich. And uh, Pistol Pete, you know, just, I guess, got his nickname because of how fast he would shoot the ball. And uh, Pistol Pete actually died on the court, a focus on the family's basketball, after he had played James Dobson. And Pistol Pete was in great health. And it was his last words that have echoed in my mind ever since I first heard the story. He had been playing so well, and James Dobson approached him and said, you know, how are you? And he said these words, I've never felt better in my life. And then passed out and hit the floor. Of course, the first thing James Dobson thought was, what would, what would you think? If someone did that to you, you know, you get a good giggle and a good laugh, uh, come to find out he'd had a massive cardiac arrest and dropped dead straight after he said those words. That is one of the most powerful testimonies I'd ever heard about a man who thought he had never felt better in his life and yet 
went home at that very moment after that. So I say that. It's a sobering thought. It's not one I want to park on for long. But we don't have tomorrow promised. None of us, no matter how good we feel today, we need to be soberly thinking that we won't face tomorrow unless God wills it. And then we look towards tomorrow and say, yeah, I've got hopes, I've got plans, I've got dreams, but I can't boast about them because I don't know whether tomorrow's even promised. Puts pressure on me to do everything I can today to do what God wants me to do. Another verse, Philippians chapter 3. If you want to turn, please do. Otherwise, just listen to me as I'll read it to you. But Philippians chapter 3 in the New Testament is, of course, Paul's opportunity to talk about the future. And he gives this instruction to the Philippian church. Brothers, I do not consider myself, verse 13, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, he says this, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So how would I paraphrase that? Looking at the words, forgetting those things which are behind, pressing towards the mark. Some people take those words and they emphasize the fact that we should never consider the past. Don't look back. Keep going forward. Forget what's behind you. Focus, focus. You know, there's this, this uh, powerful emphasis on the future. But in reality, Paul is, he's giving us a bit of instruction, and he's doing it in such a way that it's really tempered for us to, to get hold of this. He's saying, there are things that you need to let go of in order to move forward. His instruction to the Philippian church specifically was that they wouldn't be living in their past glories. They wouldn't be holding on to their past sins they would be looking forward and pressing towards the mark. He used the word in the, in the NIV, straining. I like that. It's really, in, in some ways I don't, but in other ways I do. Straining. We need to emphasize the forward motion in our lives. For some of you, it will mean you need to get over some of the past successes that you've had, which you're living in, and, and considering that that has made your life everything that, and you don't want to consider tomorrow because you've, got, you've done so many wonderful things in the past. Let's just park on those for a while. And God's saying, hey, there's more. You need, to, you need to let those things go, and you need to move forward. And, of course, for others of us who aren't as successful in the past, we might say, you know, there's that thing which holds us back from moving forward. And sadly, I think all of us can attest to it, there are some things we've done we regret so bad that it's hard for us to get beyond that, to move forward. We consider even our successes in light of our past failures, you know. I, I never forget the guy who, you know, used to have cars that would break down all the time, all the time. And finally, he bought a new one. Wow, you know. Splurged, bought a new car, got in it, turned the key, and it started first time. I mean, that was just unheard of, you know. But then, after he'd done that, he looked and he said, yeah, won't be long and it'll be in the shop. First thing he says, brand new car, still living in the past failures of all of his old car. Instead of considering how wonderful it is to be in this nice smelling new car. He's already dreading his first shop, his shirt, first trip to the shop. And some of us are like that. Some of us, no matter how good things are at the moment, we still have that thing we dread, you know. We go for a doctor's checkup and the doc says, hey, looks good. And you're already walking out of the office going, yeah, but next time it won't, you know. Just feeling the pressure of the fact that I'm, I'm dreadful about tomorrow. And we need to let go all of those things which hold us back. Because, again, Paul's emphasis is on straining to move forward. 
You need to do as Daniel did. You need to purpose in your heart to move forward. Purpose in your heart to let go of the past successes, the past failures, and move forward. I know some of you are probably singing that song now, aren't you? Let it go. It's an earworm. We all are trying to get over that. But um, Luke chapter 9 is another, if you'd like to turn. Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. And I only have one more after this. This is the end of the chapter. Jesus said some words when he was relating to these farmers, I would assume. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. No man having put his hand to the plow. If you were to paraphrase it, how would you say it? I I said this, don't get distracted from the work. Don't get distracted. You know, distraction's a horrible thing. Um, many of us who follow sport, and especially if you like the Olympics and you like watching people run, I know it's, uh, you know, watching Mo Farah is just, it's great, you know, when he comes across and does his little thing, you know, when he uh, wins a race. And, of course, another is Usian Bolt. I mean, I can't believe how fast a human being can run, you know, seeing some. But when we look back at Usain Bolt's world record, which has yet to be broken, and he's certainly not broken it, and no, no other runner uh, has yet broken his world record. Do you remember when he ran that race? Do you remember what he did when he crossed the line? Just before he crossed the line and got the world record yet to be broken, he looked behind him. Every one of us who follow the sport scream out what every coach always tells. Don't look back until you cross the line, you know, because if you look back, you're shaving seconds or milliseconds, in his case, off of your time. Just keep moving forward till you cross the line and then look to see who's behind you. So there's those of us wondering just what would the world record be if he hadn't looked back, you know. Their distraction, though, in our lives is, of course, much more consequential than that. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Jesus just doesn't want us to become distracted by our past. He doesn't want us to keep from doing the things he would like us to do because of things that have happened to us in the past. I think we really need to digest that to fully understand it. For some, you can feel that your successes might take you to great places in your life. You realize you're good at what you do, and you might actually be able to go beyond where you are. But to take it to a high level, we have this thing, this block that's somehow set, just like, you know... um, a a limiting device that says, yeah, I would never be able to do quite like that. I'll give you you an example. I've I've known people who've been in radio and television, being my industry for many years, and you would say to them, you know, would you like to manage your own radio station? Would you like to manage, be the manager? And they would say, yeah, but I don't have the education. You know, the, the things that come out. And instantly you would understand why they would say that because you'd say, yeah, if you had a bit more training, some people never let you get beyond a certain stage because you don't have the credential. But God's saying, actually, if I want you to do it, then I can take you anywhere I want you to go. And there's nothing that can limit you. Take out all of those things which you think limit you. And let God do what he wants to do with you. Do, do, do you understand? Do you follow me? Don't allow yourself to be limited. Some of you say, 
I believe God would, I, I would love to travel. I would love to go such and such a place. I'd love to be involved in ministry. And then they begin putting in the limits. But I don't have the money to do that type of thing. I don't have the time to do that. I'm too old to do those things. I'm not healthy. Enough. And you hear all the limits. We all do this. We all have these things that we put as blocks to think I can't because of. And God's saying, don't get distracted. If I want you to do it, all that stuff can, can come out. And you can do whatever it is I want you to do. Remove the blocks and let God just pull you along. Let God lead you wherever he wants you to go. And get a bigger vision. We read all those verses about expanding our tent stakes and, and you know, keeping our vision from being limited. Don't let anything hold you back. Be able to say in your heart and in your mind, God, whatever you want me to do this year, 2019, you know, it's all in front of us. And we look at 2019 and we say, wow, God, what would you like me to do? What can I accomplish through you this year? What kind of wonderful things lie ahead? And then I would just close with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I love this one. This is one of those verses that I would probably call to mind many times when Paul is likening, if we say Paul, Paul is the writer of Hebrews because he never signed his name to it. And of course, if you have a King James, it says Paul wrote it. Otherwise, we don't know. But whoever wrote Hebrews said these words, let us run with patience, chapter 12, verse 1. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Be quick, but be careful. Running, it's going fast, with patience. We say now and have uh, said since World War II, keep calm, but carry on. You know, There's all of that. When we give instructions in a fire drill, we say to people, move quickly, but calm, calmly. Because you need to carefully move forward, considering everything, but keeping your momentum going forward. So as we look at all of this, and really it's just all of those kinds of instructions we give at the beginning of every year, we need to look back at what has been accomplished in our lives, not just last year. Look all the way back to the beginning. Look at what God's been doing with you since you were born until now. But look forward and say, God, what kind of things might I see accomplished through me what kind of things might you use me to do if I let you use me? <clears throat> I can do anything, Scripture says, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, through Christ who gives me the strength. You don't have to be proud to say it. In fact, you'd be humble to say it. I can do anything he wants me to do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Let's pray.